it's my feeling that the four years that I was here was unlike any other four years in American history, to the point that I think it was CNN or public television did a documentary about the year 1968. They postulated that probably no 12 months in American history changed the social fabric, changed the country as much, and perhaps the world, as 1968. My class entered 1966. What life was like was pretty much like the 1950s. You know, the, what the American dream was, leave it to Beaver, you know, kind of uh, a stay-at-home mom, a working dad, uh, the nuclear family, as it was called. Fraternity rush, people were in suits and ties. Uh, girls went, and I say boys and girls because we were boys and girls then. Girls wore dresses. I remember, I think it was Friday night dinner at on the university meal plan at Donner Hall, you, you had to dress up. And one night a week, it was like dress up. People had short hair. The music was AM radio. And it was whatever the playlist was by the program director. That's what you heard. That's what you were introduced to. That's where you listened to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. That's when they said, here's a new act, Herman's Hermits or something. So this is what life was as we entered campus in 1966. Most of the students here were in science or engineering. As I said before, you know, that short hair. They literally had slide rolls hooked to their belts. They literally had pocket protectors. The drama students were mostly in black. The art students were, you know, paint-stained blue jeans or a big shirt. The fraternities were mainly the course, any social life. The carnival was a Greek activity. Buggy was a Greek activity. We graduated in the spring of 1970. The world was upside down. Student life on colleges was upside down. It was Kent State, you know, four students being shot by National Guardsmen. Families were ripped apart. What we see today about, you know, one political red versus blue, there were great parallels then, but it all stemmed from the Vietnam War. From 1966 to 1970, besides the anti-war feeling that came in the United States and college campuses, was also the advent of women's liberation. That came to the forefront. Also the fact that uh, civil rights had been growing and building. In 68 was the year that Martin Luther King was killed. Robert F. Kennedy was killed. Russia invaded uh, Czechoslovakia. France was, students were rioting all over the place. So you had anti-war sentiment, you had women's liberation, you had civil rights, I'm probably forgetting one or two others, all now in the front of everybody. Students now are being exposed to all this daily, and even at Carnegie Mellon. But then you also had the sentiment that had come out just before called don't trust anybody over 30. So you had ageism coming in. And you had students going home to their families and the division in the family was horrible. You know, mothers and fathers saying, what are you doing? You have to support the president. You have to support this and that. And the students, and students seeing a whole different world, a different life on campus. Before this was the summer of love. It was, you know, Pete and, and Haight-Asbury, hippies, flowers, putting in the soldiers' gun barrels, the famous pictures and stuff like that. Everybody should live in harmony and peace and love. And in 12 months, it flipped completely opposite. There was no more peace and love. The music got harder edged. You had uh, Led Zeppelin came in in late 69, early 70s. Uh, so this is all the backdrop of what was going on in campus. The idea was to send waves and waves of American bombing bombers, B-52s and whatnot, loaded to the gills, thousands of planes, and they would literally lay down a carpet of bombs over North Vietnam, and then they went into Cambodia secretly, but then that came out. It was indiscriminate. It wasn't about bombing factories or military installations. It was about bombing humans, people, and it was just laying down a carpet of mass destruction and death. And the United States kept this up with this. And now the TV networks, which was, again, only three, started to show more and more footage of this. They started sending correspondence over 
to report back Walter Cronkite and whatnot, and it changed the correspondent's view of the war. And their tone, even though it was supposed to be objective, was getting more and more, this is wrong, this war is wrong, showing the, the burned bodies, the babies being killed and whatnot. So in Congress and the Senate, you still had hawks and doves, more hawks, because there are a lot of old white guys. My vision of the activities board is we would tell all sides of the story. So we had a lot of anti-war people come on campus and speak, but the most prominent hawk in the Senate was Senator Strom Thurmond, and he was a proponent of carpet bombing. So in our wisdom, we decided to bring Strom Thurmond to campus to speak, to give that side of the story. It was the old student ballroom. Uh, they called it a ballroom. It was just a big open space in the old building. I think it's set maybe 400 or so. But he was a U.S. senator coming to Pittsburgh. So back then there were two newspapers in Pittsburgh, the morning Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and the evening Pittsburgh Press. They sent reporters and photographers. There was no video then. So the word spread The Strom Thurmond was coming to speak. So he came and he started speaking to talk about why it's important that we're in Vietnam, why carpet bombing is important. I look back and I smile because even then it was comical. Kind of, our radical element on campus was so mild compared to other universities like Columbia, Berkeley, you know, they're burning buildings, you know, police riot, tear gas and whatnot, all of these college campuses. And our radical element was really a bunch of art students more than anything, but passionate. Well, during his speech, and I'm not sure what triggered it, but the one fellow who, his name is Case Movement, I think he was the editor of the yearbook in 1970. Uh, he and a bunch of students stand up, and they start throwing marshmallows on the stage. Um, because, again, it was a small room, so they could easily, a marsh, they could easily reach Strom Thurmond. They started pummeling with marshmallows. I'm up sitting on stage uh, with him, and their cry was, don't worry, Strom, they're not bombs. If I look back, I think it was a brilliant protest because it spoke to what the issue was. Geez, aren't you feeling threatened, but they're just marshmallows, imagine all the people being bombed. And it bothers me that if you Google this thing today, people don't understand, they don't report that this is why it was. It was about the carpet bombing, but that's what it was. Well, as this is happening, his office calls because uh, Hubert Humphrey was the big liberal in the Senate, and he was trying to get past the bill on health and welfare. I forget what it was. But it was basically spending to help poor people or something like that, which Strom Thurmond hated. So they, they put that word to the Office of Student Activities that uh, he had to call his office right away. So after he's, he sits down and there's the photograph that went around the world of him sitting there with marshmallows around him, because nobody actually got the picture of the marshmallows flying. It was too sudden, and it was short. So somebody comes in and says he has to call his office, so Bob McCurdy then takes him to his office, which wasn't very private. And... He's calling and they say, you got to get back to Washington to filibuster this vote. There was all this uh, mayhem and police, people coming in and out, reporters and whatnot. And he asked me, he says, son, is there someplace more private I could talk? <clears throat> I said, well, I got a small office downstairs. It was literally a desk, a door. I mean, you couldn't, you had to stand up to let somebody pass you. So we go down and he has this little book and he's leafing through the book and he's using my phone and he's dialing the head of U.S. Steel, the head of Gulf Oil, head of Alcoa, Allegheny Ludlam, uh, J&L, and he's looking for transportation back to Washington. Memory serves, I think it was Allegheny Ludlam, but I'm not sure, but it was, uh, so finally they said, yeah, we'll, we got, we'll send you down to Washington on the corporate plane. The pictures get picked up by the wire services, and actually Time Magazine published the picture as well, with an article about it some reason my name was given out as the head of this organization as if we were the organization that wanted to humiliate him and letters are coming in addressed to me because my name was out there you know you marshmallow brained idiots at Carnegie Mellon how dare you treat the senator this way uh, you're you, you don't deserve to be in college you know nothing supporting it because it wasn't really reported that students are protesting the carpet bombing you know it was internationally famous for a brief moment 
Well, after I left Pittsburgh and, and went back and started my other life in business, uh, I was at the old Charlotte Airport, which is small. I was at the gate waiting for my flight, and there was this big uh, entourage coming down the hall. I could see everybody was all about somebody famous, you know, as if it was Elvis Presley or the Beatles or somebody. And I recognized that it's Strom Thurmond coming down, and he had one assistant with him, but they're all talking to him, and he was like a rock star. And back then, there was no selfies, or and people didn't really ask for autographs. They just wanted to be near him. This is the South, so it's like his home turf. I don't know what possessed me, but I stood up, and I started walking toward him right in the middle of the hallway, so he would literally hit me. And he stopped in front of me, and I said, Senator, uh, you may not remember me, but we've met in the past. He said, how do I know you, son? And I said, I was at Carnegie Mellon. I was the student that brought you to campus for the marshmallow thing. He said, were you the student that helped me? Were you the young man that helped me that day? I said, yes, I was. He said, well, come over here, boy. And he sits me down by the gate. Now, there's a whole crowd of people around listening to us. And he goes, how are you? How's your family? How how the family? Tell me about your family. The man never met me, but this is the way they did things back then. So we chatted about this or that. What are you doing now, son? And he said, well, you come to Washington. You come and we'll go out to dinner. We'll have a good time. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, I had no intention of doing that. But that, um, so that was my, my Strom Thurmond story. I put Carnegie Mellon in the news internationally. 